Birmingham, England was ravaged by damage in World War II and the industrial reconstruction that often felt grim and hopeless in the post-war decades. The Birmingham Blitz by the Nazi Air Force lasted from August 1940 to April of 1943. Almost 2,000 tons of bombs were dropped on the city, making it the third most targeted city in the United Kingdom. The massive destruction resulted in 20 years of rebuild that left the city filled with glum estates and high-rises that often felt without character or comfort. Despite this, or perhaps because of it, Birmingham became a breeding ground for many iconic rock and pop bands seeking to escape the dark reality of industrial urban existence. Each of these bands, in their own way, forever redefined and recharged the sound and meaning of modern music. Black Sabbath, Duran Duran, Judas Priest, Steel Pulse, The English Beat, UB40, the list goes on. These bands won popular acclaim and critical respect and inspired countless other bands around the world, forever marking Birmingham as an enduring landmark, a genuine home to the very best modern music has had to offer. It was also the home of the move. The move formed in late 1965, billed as a supergroup in the Birmingham scene and comprised of some of the most highly regarded performers playing in and around the city at the time. Originally aspiring to a sound reminiscent of The Who and The Rolling Stones, with a particular focus on three, four, and five-part harmonies, the band featured Bev Bevan on the drums, Trevor Burton on guitar, and Ace Kefford on bass and vocals. Carl Wayne was the lead singer and frontman. Roy Wood served as a singer and guitarist and was a principal songwriter of the band. The sound the band produced in its early years was unique. It was intriguing and difficult to define. Part pop, part blues, and part psychedelic freak rock, it eventually evolved into glam and progressive rock. But in the beginning, it seemed like it was just a big party, with its center at Birmingham's iconic Cedar Club. I think it was a social place, the Cedar Club. It was the place to be, it was late night. Yeah. So if we had two or three or two shows elsewhere, then we'd all meet, congregate at the Cedar Club. Uh, we all started, uh, we all used to play in the same club, three different groups, and uh, it was kind of a couple from each group. <laughs> and we, we got together to form one, yeah. <laughs> The move was created following a chance meeting between Ace Kefford, Trevor Burton, and David Bowie at a Birmingham club where he was performing as Davy Jones in the lower third. Impressed with their talents, Bowie urged the two to find the best players in town and make a super group to leverage their own skills and talents. It made sense to them. That was was David Jones, as he was, David Bowie's advice to, uh, to Trevor and to Ace. And that's what they did. The first person they asked was Roy Wood. And then they asked me. Um, I'm not sure, it's a bit of a gray area. They might have asked John Bonham before me. I don't know, they won't admit to that. And then John Bonham was my best mate anyway. We'd known each other for years. He played with me two uncles in the group called Our Life. So I went up and I said, John, I said, uh, we're doing this thing. We've got me, um, Trevor and, and Roy Wood. Uh, do you want to come with us, like, on the drums? And uh, he turned us down. 
He said, I don't. He didn't want to do it anyway. He wanted to carry on with these with Robert Plant now. Uh, and then, <laughs> uh, and finally, they asked Carl Wayne, and yeah. the five of us did as David Bowie had advised. Yeah. Once the key people were in place, the decision for a name of this new supergroup came naturally, as the band saw themselves as part of the burgeoning musical and social movement. And so, just like the Who shortened their name from the Hooligans, the movement was shortened simply to the move. I don't really know. All as I know, the movement was the first suggestion. And with the Who and all bands like that, it was a great idea just to cut it in half and just use the move. Oh. The band began to book more and more live shows throughout the UK. Their onstage energy and passionate performances were sufficiently wild and unusual to attract the attention of Tony Secunda, an up-and-coming manager at the time who had guided the Moody Blues to success and who offered to do the same for the move. Secunda's management style would prove to be less like Brian Epstein and more like Malcolm McLaren. Under Tony Secunda's management, the move quickly made a name for themselves and within months secured a production contract with eccentric producer Tammy Cordell, who later went on to produce such diverse acts as Pro Call Harem, Tom Petty, and the Cranberries. The sound they created was quickly evolving into a mix of pop, psychedelic rock, as well as an odd combination of sound approaches, largely previously unheard, and that would eventually splinter into two radically different genres punk rock and progressive rock. Secunda's instincts for promotion were unrelenting, and under his guidance the band stirred controversy by signing their production contract on the back of a topless woman. It would not be the move's last controversial or provocative action. Got involved with Tony Secunda, who got us a residency at the Marquee Club. One night, the guys from Mother's Club, you heard of Mother's Club, Phil Myers and all that. They brought this guy called Tony Seconda there, like, because he'd had the Moody Blues, mm. Tony, mm. and had a success with them. And uh, he watched us, like, and the next thing we knew, we was gigging in London at the Marquee and all that. You know? And we got ourselves a residency. After, by about, after about three months, I think we had every record company in London wanting to sign us. Mm. You play, you try and create an atmosphere. Yeah. You know, um, if you play very quietly, you can't get a, such a reaction. You don't feel so good, so we play according to how we feel. <laughs> what's your step? 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 We, we put together a really tight, we're the tightest band I've ever been in. Mm. You, you show off uh, more than what you do normally, you know, it's yeah. presentation, <laughs> you know, um, you act if you like, <laughs> and uh, you have to do this as much as possible, you know, great big movements. And, and then he put us in the gangs and all that stuff. He's a bloody incredible bloke. Yeah, he, he was a great fan of, he wanted us to be really outrageous. The one thing he had us doing was that uh, was smashing up televisions on stage at Colway with a massive axe. Literally, and we'd, go and pick, we'd stop on the way to a gig, pick up a couple of TVs from a, a second-hand shop for yeah. a fiver. And then at the end of the show, um, while Ace was singing What's Your Step, an old Bobby Parker song, and he'd, Carl would be smashing these TVs to bits, <laughs> and I'd be kicking my drums all over the place. And, <laughs> and, the, and the story was that we're destroying televisions because it's the one-eyed monster in right. your house and right. you must not watch it, it's, it's like Big Brother. By this time, things began to happen rapidly, fueled at least in part by their wild onstage personality and promotional gags, 
egged on by their manager Secunda. For example, the group was banned from Soho after chainsawing a Cadillac to pieces, jamming London traffic for hours, and banned from Rome after blowing up smoke bombs on stage. The road manager of the move um, threw the bombs because rather a large bank which seemed to disturb the very brave Italian police. It served a purpose, didn't it? It was publicity, right? Really. Despite its tongue-in-cheek approach to psychedelic pop and catchy earworm of a melody, Night of Fears did not quite have the strength to dislodge the number one song of the time, Daydream Believer by the Monkees. Defeat at the hands of the Monkees notwithstanding, the band persisted. They were nurturing a growing following in the UK and soon followed Night of Fears with I Can Hear the Grass Grow. I Can Hear the Grass Grow rose quickly up the charts, but could not reach the number one position, only climbing as high as number five on the UK singles charts. Again, unable to dislodge the monkeys, who prevailed over the move with their song, It's a Little Bit Me, It's a Little Bit You. Just as the move prepared to release their debut album and gather the momentum needed to keep them moving up the charts, another obstacle arose. The new album's master tapes were stolen from their agent's car. They were forced to pay a ransom for their return, and all the tapes, although the tapes were returned after the bribe was paid, they arrived damaged and most of the music had to be re-recorded, delaying the release substantially. No suspect was ever identified, but some speculated that it was simply an ill-conceived promotional trick by manager Secunda to draw attention to the forthcoming record. Despite this distraction, the move finished the album and scored another top five song, the title song off the Flowers in the Rain album. The single Flowers in the Rain earned a small place in history by being the first song ever played on BBC One. Despite this highly respected achievement, the move were again barely edged out of the number one chart spot. But at least this time it wasn't by the Monkees, but rather by a young and virile Engelbert Humperdinck. Losing the top spot yet again was not to be the only obstacle arising from the release of Flowers in the Rain. As part of the promotional materials for their album, their manager Tony Secunda released a postcard featuring a naughty and suggestive cartoon featuring a famous politician of the time and his secretary in a compromising position. The politician and the secretary sued and they were awarded the entire royalties for the song Flowers in the Rain in perpetuity. The royalties were ultimately donated to charity but cost the band hundreds of thousands of dollars and deeply strained their confidence and trust in one another and the system in general. It also resulted in the band's termination of their publicity-hungry manager, Tony Secunda. It, it, well, it was bad for them. It was a bad thing. I, we wish it never had happened. Because mm. it, for a start, we, we broke with our manager over it. And it, it was a good manager, Tony Secunda. Mm. But that was a step too far. It was a step too far. And because of that, we, we had to park up with it. Following Secunda's departure as their manager, the remainder of 1967 and 1968 remained a roller coaster ride for the move, both exhilarating and tumultuous. In November 1967, the band managed to get on the bill of a package tour that featured the Jimi Hendrix experience, as well as such newcomers to the experimental pop scene as Pink Floyd, when Sid Barrett was still in the band. The shows introduced the band to a larger audience and massively influenced the move's collective lives and music in profound and irreversible ways. We did this amazing tour with Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. So it was Hendrix, The Move, Amen Corner, and right at the bottom of the bill, I think he even said, The Pink Floyd. <laughs> and they got like 10 minutes, and that was it. The highs of 1968 continued when the band were asked to be part of the inaugural session of the Isle of Wight Festival, featuring headliner Jefferson Airplane, as well as T-Rex, and the crazy world of Arthur Brown. Additionally, the Moo's new single, Fire Brigade, was released and reached number three on the UK charts.
1968 presented, however, tragic and profound difficulties with the band. During the package tour with Jimi Hendrix and Pink Floyd, bassist Ace Keffert began to join Pink Floyd's eccentric Sid Barrett in his experiments with LSD. His heavy drug use had a serious and negative effect on Keffert, causing him to suffer what has been variously described as a nervous breakdown or a series of extreme panic attacks. His unpredictable behavior led to his dismissal from the move, a radical change from which he would never fully recover. Uh, all I want is a bass from guitar. Um, it's obviously changed the whole sound. Um, and the vocalist changed the whole sound, because we used to be, do a lot of five-piece vocals, you know, four-piece harmonies is one purpose of singing. Um, yeah, it did, and the direction changed a lot, the music changed a lot as well. In late 1968, the band's career continued to be rocked by struggles. Their fifth signal, Wild Tiger Woman, did poorly commercially, failing to chart at all. The failure, perhaps, was not completely surprising, as the song included lyrics such as, She's tied to the bed, waiting to be fed. A vague but naughty allusion to sex that led to BBC banning the song. It seemed that, wherever the group went, it was getting banned for one thing or another, but it no longer seemed cute, and the band seemed less stable than ever. The Moo's next single, Blackberry Way, was drearier in lyric than their early psych-pop records, but its melody was reminiscent of the Beatles' Penny Lane and struck a chord with the public. It was the band's first and only number one, managing to briefly dethrone Fleetwood Mac as well as Stevie Wonder and Nina Simone. The record spent one week at the top. It didn't seem that anyone in the band was interested in celebrating its brief stint at the top of the charts. Band spirits continued to spiral downwards. In particular, Trevor Burton was growing discontented with the clashing personalities in the band, as well as the poppier glam rock direction the band was headed. That lad didn't leave the room because I hated Black Lady Way, that's, that's not true. I left the room because I wanted to play the blues, and, and uh, go off in a different direction. Um, and get out of the pop world for a bit. Yeah. The tension culminated in an onstage fistfight between Burton and drummer Bev Bevins, which resulted in Burton walking off stage and quitting the band. He was replaced by Rick Price, a talented musician who eventually contributed songwriting efforts for several of the band's later songs. The band's struggles continued in 1969. Traveling to America after being invited to open for the Stooges, a new band steeped in a quickly growing genre, punk rock, and fronted by Iggy Pop, whose unpredictable and often self-flagellating life performances made the moves wildness, which only a few years earlier was cutting edge and apparent dangerous, seem tame and quaint. During the early days of the U.S. tour, Rick Price was dosed with LSD and destroyed a hotel room as well as original film shot by drummer Brett Bev Brevens, resulting in Price's immediate expulsion from the tour and return to England. The move played only a few more shows in America before canceling the tour due to lack of interest and support from both the public and the record company. They returned to the U.K., never to tour in the U.S. again. A new The Move album called Shazam was released in 1970. The record was an even greater departure from the psych rock that they'd spent years formulating. Driven by Wood's affinity for more orchestral compositions, Carl Wayne began to feel frustrated by the new direction of the music. Rory Wood did not feel much differently about Wayne, annoyed and offended by the more traditional cabaret influences that Wayne sought to inject into the band's sound and image including campy advertisement campaigns. Personal relations were crumbling, and after Wood engaged in a fight with a drunken fan, Carl Wayne left the band, one day before the release of Shazam. With three original members of the band gone, and only Roy Wood and Bev Bevins remaining, the band barely resembled its former self. 
and its sound bore little resemblance to the earlier years. To further distance themselves from their past sound, in a move that would permanently alter the move, Carl Wayne's replacement was another Birmingham musician, Jeff Lynne, who had a style that was completely his own. Along with Roy Wood, Lynn was determined to shift the band's musical path to a new style of experimental music that eventually evolved in what became known as progressive rock. The move released two more albums and an extended play single, mostly to satisfy contractual obligations, but there was no real public interest remaining. No further songs broke the top five, although Brontosaurus was a favorite to many for its dark sound which in retrospect seems a precursor to heavy metal. The sound confused many fans who only months earlier were hearing songs like Curly from the band. The inconsistency of sound in the band suggested confusion and frustration of its members, and not the energy and experimentation that was so prevalent in their early work. The band released its final UK single in April of 1972. California Man reached 11 in the UK charts before quickly sliding down. It was clear that the move was now fundamentally a different band than the one it was when it started in 1965. Oddly enough, the move's only single that ever charted in the United States was Do Ya, which was only released in the UK as the B-side to California. It reached number 93 in the US. By the end of 1972, it was clear the move was over, and the band officially disbanded, the result of a combination of commercial frustrations creative tensions, drugs, financial problems, and personal conflicts. Well, I think we just went too many different directions. I think we just never settled into a rock and groove. You know, most bands have got a sound, but for me, we're all over the place. And that was that. Ace Kefford continued to decline into drugs, alcohol, and mental illness. He attempted a solo record which included musicians such as Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin backing him, but he couldn't handle the pressure and walked out of the sessions never to return. His solo work built a small cult following through bootleg cassettes and CDs and were eventually released as The Lost Tapes in 2003. Carl Wayne continued to embrace cabaret style music and spent much of the 70s, 80s, and 90s co-starring in quirky British television programs and musical shows. He passed away in 2004 of esophageal cancer. He was 61. Trevor Burton continued to play music in a variety of bands, including the short-lived Balls, a collection of Birmingham-based musicians managed by Tony Secunda with the intention of becoming the next Birmingham supergroup. The group endured a series of personal disputes and financial struggles and recorded only one single, which was not released until after the band broke up. Despite this, Burton remained a well-respected guitarist who has toured and recorded music through a career that has lasted over 40 years. In 2015, he was inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame. Roy Wood and Bev Bevan, along with their new partner Jeff Lynne, continued to explore progressive rock, forming Electric Light Orchestra, a monster of progressive rock which, in the 70s and 80s, went on to record and release more combined UK and US number one records than any band in the world. Despite the success of ELO, Roy Wood soon tired of its direction and quit, forming his own project Wizard, spelled with two Zs. Its biggest hit was I Wish It Was Christmas Day, which continues to be a perennial Christmas time favorite in Great Britain. Wood remains a public figure, appearing from time to time on television shows and public events throughout the UK. Rick Price joined Roy Wood's band Wizard and continues to write and perform new music for a dedicated audience of fans. After ELO, Jeff Lynne separately had a successful production career, producing records for George Harrison and Tom Petty, 
He was also a member of the Traveling Wilburys, along with Bob Dylan, Tom Petty, George Harrison, and Roy Orbison. Manager Tony Secunda remained in the record industry and eventually went on to manage Motorhead, The Pretenders, selling millions of records. And with that, the move simply disappeared. That is the base reality of the relativity of time. A minor league pop band that never quite made it into the majors, although for a moment it seemed like enduring fame was just inches away. They opened for some of history's greatest headliners. Jimi Hendrix, Jefferson Airplane, The Stooges, but never made it to the level of historic headliner themselves. Despite their brush with greatness, even the cult fanboy podcasts rarely play them anymore, replaced by hipper things. The move as a stark example of the disposability of art is hard to deny. Through the years, there have been various cover songs, re-releases, partial reunions, and greatest hits compilations. But the grandiose dreams of the band crumbled like those grand old Victorian brownstones, torn aside for bigger, more sterile and shiny high-rises. In 2017, the Electric Light Orchestra was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The move was not. Timelessness seems to embrace some and elude others. And so it seems to be true for us all. We are born, we live for a while, we die. Echoes are left behind by each of us that guide those that we leave behind, who themselves inherit a burden to create their own echoes that will guide those that follow them, and so on and so on. These echoes can be loud as thunder or quiet as a mouse. There is greatness in them all, and we are guided by them all. Let the wind blow you out of my memory Let the rain wash you out of my eyes Too many bad times of loving you Now I gotta realize That I can throw you right out of my mind And put you right back in your place Cause lightning never strikes twice in the same place 